What is Acts about? That's what we're going to talk about today in Acts 1. So Acts starts off where we left off with the Gospel of Luke, same writer. This book is broken up into three different parts, where the church starts in Jerusalem, then goes out throughout Judea and Samaria. Remember, the Samaritans are the people that there was a lot of conflict and looking badly with each other, giving each other the eyeballs, and then the rest of the Mediterranean world. We're going to talk about the church in its beginning. And sometimes people say, well, it's split up in two. It's going to be the Acts of Peter and the disciples and then the Acts of Paul. We're seeing that after Jesus showed himself to so many people and the word started getting out, this early church started forming. And it wasn't just made up of Jewish people. It was made up of Gentiles as well. And Gentiles could be Hellenized Jews, meaning Jews that didn't really believe in being very Jewish, but they were more Greek than Jewish. But there were also Greeks. Really, at this time, this land was a cross section of the world. People were here from all over the place, and trade also brought people even farther out. And then we'll start seeing how this early church takes off. This letter, again, is written to Theophilus. We talked about how some people didn't think there was a Theophilus. It just, the word itself means lover of God. Is this a, just a generic Gentile person who believed in God? But other gospels said, no, 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 he's a real person. He lived from this time to that time. In fact, uh, people said that at the beginning in Luke, it called him most excellent, which of course makes me think about Bill and Ted, but most excellent Theophilus. He's writing this story so that he can understand and believe. Maybe he's a new Christian. Scholars believe that Theophilus became a believer in between the two writings. So he wasn't a believer before, but now he believes. And so we're going to talk about what happens next, now that he is a Christian. Luke says, you know, that he writes everything down in an orderly fashion, that he is an eyewitness and gathered this information from other eyewitnesses. And he was able to write in a different style of Greek. He, he knew many different styles of Greek, that, which makes him such an excellent author, is that he can speak to different people with different education levels. But that's what we're going to talk about now. We believe this is Luke. This is the person that traveled with Peter and then eventually traveled with Paul. And Paul refers to him as our dear friend Luke the doctor in Colossians. So we know that he was someone who was there. Some people think, oh, well, maybe it's not Luke. But if it's not Luke, it is a person just like Luke. So we might as well just call him Luke. Again, another question to ask when we get to heaven. <laughs> but there's no reason to doubt it. But OK, we don't have to fight about it. So this Luke shows us this history of the early church. And we're going to start off with receiving the power of the Holy Spirit and then going to what they called the ends of the earth, this time about it. And people feel this was written somewhere around 62 AD, that the story starts itself at 30 AD and then continues on to 62 AD, which is the time of Paul when he was under house arrest. Well, we're not going to spoil alert the story, but he talks about how this early church witnesses to believers, goes out and acts among the people and the challenges they faced, you know, how it's not easy to be a Christian in this world. People feel that this book was written in Rome because he was close to Paul and Paul was in prison at Rome. We also don't think that Paul was dead yet. So we understand it's really in that key crucial time. He doesn't talk about the burning of Rome. That's, I think, where Nero supposedly fiddled. Nero was an artist, a musician kind of guy. I don't think he fiddled while Rome burned, but that's, you know, the story. But that happened in 64 AD. So that sort of puts an end point to the story because we never really talk about that happening. The Christians got blamed for that happening when chances are it was not the Christians' fault. And some overarching messages that we're going to get inside of the book of Acts or the Acts of the Apostles is that Christianity is not out to cause harm. Roman officials themselves embraced Christianity. 
that Christianity is innocent of the things that people said of it because there were judges that could not prosecute them because they were found innocent, and that Christianity is a fulfillment of Judaism, which was a religion, a faith that was okay in the Roman Empire. This wasn't a new faith. We weren't inventing a new faith, but instead we're continuing on or fulfilling the things that Judaism said. So this was part of the same message that we have been getting all along. And Luke himself said he was doing this so that we can know for certainty what things happen, that we can understand these things, and that we can be taught by them. There was mention that Justin Martyr knew the stories in Acts, and that was somewhere around 100 AD, that in his book, Apology, not apology like I apologize to you, but an explanation that the men from Jerusalem went out in 12 and were instructed to speak in the same word. This idea that the Acts of the Apostles were something that Justin Martyr understood and knew that he probably got from this book. So we'll just go ahead and get started in the Acts. It says that in his first book, Theophilus, I dealt with the issues of Jesus. You know, so he, all the things that he taught and he did, and then he was taken up. He, he left us and he went back up to live with God the Father. And he presented himself, it says, alive for 40 days in speaking about the kingdom of God. So we know he came back. This wasn't a mystery. He did come back to everyone. He told them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. For you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but now you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. He told him to stay there. He probably had to tell him to stay there because Peter kept going fishing. Just stay here, okay? Wait here, no fishing. There's no fishing in Jerusalem. I think this was probably a Peter thing. They gather together and they ask him, you know, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They're still looking at this all wrong. They're thinking that this is the restoration of the kingdom of David, that we're going to bring the 12 tribes back together that we're going to have this nation back again. It's interesting because Jesus doesn't really say, no, 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 my spirit, my kingdom, my work, everything is not about this kingdom that you're looking to restore. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons because this has been fixed by his own authority. I mean, this is going to come back as a kingdom, but you don't get to know when. Instead, you'll receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is about what's going to happen next. And you're going to get the Holy Spirit, and you're going to go out there and be my witnesses. You're going to tell people what you saw. I, I, like I said, I think sometimes people get pressured about being a witness from Jesus that they have to be eloquent speakers, or they have to be able to produce this excellent presentation. But instead, they are just telling people what they have witnessed. And when they said that, they were looking and he was lifted up from the clouds and taken out of sight. And while they were gazing into the heavens, two men were standing there in the white robes. I think it's these two guys. You know, they asked those really good questions at the tomb. Like, why do you seek the one who is resurrected in this tomb? Some people thought that this was Moses and Elijah, the two men that were in white robes at the transfiguration. We don't know. Why are you standing here looking into heaven? Jesus, who was taken up into heaven, will come the same way you saw him go into heaven. Jesus is not coming back as a baby. He's not coming back in a, in, in a way that we can mistake. Is he going to come back on the Mount of Olives, which is where this ascension took place, and then march into that eastern gate that has been sealed and locked to prevent the Messiah from coming back? but he is coming back in the same way he went up. It says that they went to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. That's, again, the what I call the Olive Garden, or now there's the Church of All Nations that stands at this place on the other side of the Kidron Valley on Mount Olive. And it said that they were there a Sabbath day journey away. And so when they went into the upper room that they were staying at, Peter and John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Mathis, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas, the son of James, were all of one accord. They were devoting themselves to prayer. The women were there, Mary, mother of Jesus and his brothers. 
And Peter stood up among them and, and all the people, it says, that were around them, which was about 120 people. G- Judas was one of us. And then he became a guide to the people who arrested Jesus. But we were 12. You know, I think that's what he's saying. We were 12 in this ministry. We should, now that he was used to acquire this field of blood, this is going to be something that was mentioned in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, we should really find someone else to take his place. Jesus didn't call on them to replace this disciple, but they decided to do that. Some people were saying, well, that it, it shows that sin had a victory and we need to make this group whole again. They put forward, it says, names, Joseph called Barsabbas and Matthias, Matthew. And they prayed and they said, Lord, you know our heart. They cast lots and the lots fell upon Matthias. And instead of now having 11 apostles, we had 12. What's interesting about it is when you read a lot of the different commentaries about this, some people have a theory. And again, this is just their personal theory, but that Paul was meant to be the 12th disciple. And they just didn't wait long enough for that position to get filled by Paul because they said, well, the proof of that is we never really heard of anything Matthias said or did after this point. Some of the people are like, well, no, not every apostle is talked about in the same way. We hear a lot more about Peter than we hear about other apostles. So just because he's not mentioned much doesn't mean he's any lesser of an apostle than anyone else. But again, another good question to ask God when we get to heaven. Now, our apostles are back to 12, and that ends Act 1. What I'm going to meditate about this week on that is the the idea that when Jesus comes back, it's going to be in that same kind of way that he left. And boy, what a wonder that is going to be. I'm going to meditate on his return someday. Of course, we don't know the time and we don't know the place. Well, we know the place. We don't know the time, but we do know the place, and it's going to be on that Mount Olive. You know, I wish when I was in Jerusalem, I guess I took the Mount Olive more seriously. It's not that I didn't take it seriously, but I wasn't a Christian. And so I looked around. I was like, oh, yeah, that's nice, you know, kind of thing. Now I wish I could go back and see it as a Christian. What I'm going to pray about is that I always do what they did, that when they are in times of confusion, they're not sure what to do. They stood together and they prayed. Peter stood up, it said, among his brother, took leadership and decided what to do next, to have that kind of peace and that mind to to move on. They knew that they had to move on, but they started that moving on with prayer. And what I'm going to share with others is this idea that God wants us to continue on, regardless of what happens, whatever it is we see, we're supposed to continue on following Jesus and and move on from where we were, but always also listening. Jesus told them to stay. Don't go fishing. Stay right here. And they did it, you know. And so I think this combination of obedience to God, but also looking out to what to do next. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please tell a friend and let them know we're going to start the Acts of the Apostles. Have a wonderful weekend.